So greetings again and welcome to this second talk on the Eightfold Path. And this will continue to be an introductory talk and then tomorrow I'll start on the first factor of the path. And as a way of um, introducing it, I also want to say briefly the essence of the first factor of the path. And that has to do with understanding suffering. To really understand the arising, the appearance of suffering, the cessation of suffering, to really understand how to be free of suffering. And so the Eightfold Path is a path that is walked uh, in relationship to this freedom of suffering. And there's two general ways that I talked about yesterday, to say it a different way, in which the Eightfold Path exists for people. One is, it's the path that people who are awakened walk. And, um, and second, it's the path people on the way to awakening walk. And, um, and awakening or enlightenment are kind of vague terms, but the essence of it is this freedom from suffering. Those who are free from suffering walk this path. Those who are on their way to freedom walk this path. It's the same path, but in one, it's kind of fully developed in the awakened ones, and those on the way to awakening, to freedom from suffering, it's being cultivated and developed and grown further. But what's interesting about this is that it's this kind, it's the same path, and it points to a principle that for me, and I, is very important, and I think something very important for me to try to convey as a teacher is that um, the um, that it's important not to, not to set up too strong of a separation between where we're going in practice, in a sense, the freedom from suffering to be awake or enlightened, and the practice along that way. And how not to make a strong separation is to understand something about the qualities of a heart, a mind that's free of suffering. And to have those qualities, practice those qualities as we walk the path. To have aspects of awakening in how we practice even as a beginner. And, uh, and so, the means, the practice, the means, should contain a bit of the, of the goal. And um, the means doesn't justify the goal. The goal informs the means, how we practice. And um, so uh, to give you a little different example, uh, to cultivate, gen to be generous, one practices generosity. To be kind, one practices kindness. The goal is to be generous, and how that's done is by being generous. The goal is to be a kind, the, we practice it to be kind. The goal is to become the Eightfold Path. Someone who's fully awakened is said to become the Eightfold Path, to be endowed with the Eightfold Path. Uh, to, who have really entered into the Eightfold Path. Uh, the way to become such a person is to practice the Eightfold Path. To say this a different way, uh, the freedom from suffering is synonymous with the freedom, freedom from clinging. Clinging is the source, the, the cause, the condition for suffering. Without that clinging, the suffering that Buddhism wants to address will not exist. The suffering, the dukkha that Buddhism addresses, it is that which arises from clinging. Some popular in common English, we might refer to different kinds of pain, emotional pain, as suffering. And some of them, if that doesn't arise from clinging, would not be, a liberated person would feel as well. But really, the clinging-based suffering and so the freedom from clinging 
is the what an enlightened person has, as we practice the path of awakening, we want to bring that sense of non-clinging in the practice itself. All along the way, we want to practice non-clinging. And so we want to not cling to Buddhism, not cling to the Eightfold Path, not cling to the different factors of the Eightfold Path. We practice them with devotion, with dedication, but to hold them lightly and openly and not to, not to um, uh, live with kind of strong uh, compulsive desire around it, expectation, demands, not a lot of comparative thinking, someone else is further in the path than me, not a lot of ego involved, like look at me, I'm the great one who's on the Eightfold Path. All those represent forms of clinging. So to be sensitive all along, from being a beginner all the way, to the role that clinging has in our suffering, and to begin practicing non-clinging, even if it's a modicum of it from the very beginning. And it might be, a, I don't know if it's simple, but it, might in, it includes not clinging in relationship to how we cling. Not having strong desire, not having a, a strong, not being caught up in desires uh, when we're craving, like wanting it away, wanting not to show it to people that we have this way, to not have aversion to aversion. So, so there's this kind of art of cultivating awareness that lets things be but doesn't feed them or fuel them. And that's the task of non-clinging. The Eightfold Path, as a, what the, how a, an enlightened person walks, is how someone walks who has no clinging. For someone who is on the path to awakening, it's how they cultivate non-clinging. They cultivate it by having uh, what's called right view, right intention, or right consideration, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right um, effort, and right mindfulness, and right concentration. And uh, the, uh, the word fold in Eightfold Path um, refer, kind of uh, refers to it's all one thing that has different folds in it. The more proper translation into English of the Pali is the eight-factored path. It's a singular, singular path, but has all these different aspects. And those aspects live together in harmony, together. And, um, and it isn't necessarily that we can f- practice one after the other, but uh, uh, the idea is that they all are expression of the same thing, of non-clinging. And that's kind of part of what, one of the tasks is to understand how these things are an expression of non-clinging. The, um, so these eight factors of the path, and, um, and the word right is used in front of each one. And the Pali word is samma, S-A-M-M, long A. And it um, uh, has a number of different meanings. It can also mean complete. So it's the complete view, complete intention or consideration, the complete speech. It can also be harmonious. It's that which is harmonious. But what it's in harmony with, it's in harmony with the other factors, in harmony with non-clinging. I don't know if the Buddha understood the etymology of the word, but the ancient etymology of this word that precedes the Buddha is... um, uh, uh, coming along together. These different factors come along together. Uh, and this coming along together for the same direction, the same purpose, is kind of the meaning of samma. The word right, um, maybe is a fine translation. Uh, I like the translation, if we understand right, in the sense of a, uh, using the right tool. Um, you don't want to use a hammer to uh, unscrew a screw. Um, You use a screwdriver. The screwdriver is the right tool. The hammer might be the right tool for nailing in a nail. And so 
these um, these these eight factors, these eight sets of practices, are the appropriate tool, the appropriate means, for not just becoming awake, becoming enlightened, but rather living a life of awakening. And this is an important distinction. It isn't that the Buddhism is about becoming an enlightened person for its own sake, just become enlightened and live in an enlightened enti- uh, retirement, but rather it's to transform the person to live a life, to walk, a li- walk through life, to live a life that um, uh, is an expression of freedom, an expression of non-clinging. And it's all of who we are. It's, it's our entire way of being in the world that uh, is changed or becomes in harmony or li- comes along with um, non-clinging, with freedom. And, um, and so these eight factors are both practices to do and they're also uh, wonderful questions, wonderful explorations uh, around the topic of non-clinging. How is it that speech can be informed or can be done without any clinging? How is it that the actions in our, in our world, how we live in the world with our actions, are, are right, right actions in the sense that actions without clinging, what does clinging have to do with it? With livelihood, with effort, with mindfulness, right mindfulness, how does that come along? How is that an expression of non-clinging? And how has concentration become an expression of non-clinging? So this idea that um, the uh, eight factors of this path are the, ex- the discovery and the expression of non-clinging. It helps us discover it and helps us to express it, to be it. And how does that work? And why is it that non-clinging is so valuable in this sense? And what is it about non-clinging that should provide the, the, these wonderful eight qualities for a human being? And why should you want it? So the Noble Eightfold Path, the, eight, the eight-factored path of the noble ones, of so the non-clinging ones. So that's the introduction, and tomorrow we'll start with... Um, Um, the first factor of the path, a right view, and we'll, we'll go from there. Thank you.